Let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I will admit that as I have begun to think about my tenure here and the preaching that I have done over the past 29 years and, and all of the, the, the biblical truth that I have tried to present, and, and, and I'm realizing that that's starting to come to an end on a regular basis anyway, I thought it would be a good thing for me to do to spend the rest of my time in review. So what I want to do for the weeks that I have left or the months that I have left is I want to spend some time in 1st and 2nd Timothy sharing with you what I have presented as being important to me in the ministry and why it's important and what I believe is important to us. The message that just keeps coming back over and over again in my heart and in my mind. And I've chosen 1st and 2nd Timothy because Paul is writing to a younger Timothy about his ministry in the local church. And I think there's so much there that pertains to who we are and what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I want to use this as a way to encourage you to keep up the good fight as we continue to work together to serve the Lord in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. Now, I've entitled this series, The Good Fight. And the reason that I've entitled it The Good Fight is because that's what Paul referred to it as as he was talking to Timothy. Not less than three times in First and Second Timothy does he talk about the ministry of the kingdom of God as a fight of some sort. In chapter 1, verse 18, he calls it warfare. In chapter 6 and verse 12, he talks about the fight of faith. And over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, he calls it the good fight. So we see this theme throughout. Paul is saying to Timothy, it's not going to be easy. And we've learned that together, haven't we? It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be popular. It is not going to always be politically correct or socially acceptable. But it is our fight. The gospel of Jesus Christ is something that we have learned to stand upon and to teach and to preach. And the word of God is so significant to us because it gives us his instruction on how we are to follow after him, how we are to live as his children, how we are to be his church. And it may not be popular, but it's truth. So as we begin in chapter 1, I find this is an interesting way to begin a letter. There's not a lot of greeting here. Just a couple of simple verses. And then he gets right into a very serious warning. Follow along as I read. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Now here comes the warning. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Look this way for a second. He's going to write two very powerful letters. But notice that he begins with this warning. Beware false teaching. Do you reckon this morning that there's some false teaching in our world? Can we resonate with this warning? Coming from within and without of the church, there is false doctrine, there is false teaching. It is prevalent. We need to deal with this problem today the same way that Timothy needed to deal with that problem in the first century. He goes on nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Mm. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Beware 
false teachings. Now, if we're going to beware false teachings, and this is something that he makes clear throughout 1 and 2 Timothy, we need to be keenly aware. We need to do everything that we can do as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to know what is true teaching. The great problem we have in the church today is not so much that false teachers have come in. That's a part of it. The biggest problem is that most people in our churches today don't know what's true from what's not. And he's going to say to Timothy over and over and over again, get in the word, Timothy, get in the word, Timothy, stay in the word, Timothy, stay in the truth, because all of these ideologies are going to be coming at you And you need to be able to discern truth. Boy, when we talk about truth in our culture today, we know that can mean a lot of things. I looked up truth this past week, and I got a few definitions. One was a definition of personal truth. You know, we have that. And and it said this, beliefs that are true for an individual, that's me or you, based either on their own experiences, feelings, and perspectives. So I get to have my personal truth, and I have some. Can I tell you one? I hate cantaloupe. (laughs) You laugh, but that statement is as true as the day is long. Hate it. All cantaloupe. I've hated it since I was a child. I still hate it just as much today. Not only will I not eat cantaloupe, I won't eat fruit associated with cantaloupe. That rules out most melons. I will not order a fruit cup from a restaurant. Why? It's got cantaloupe. And I don't eat fruit that's touched cantaloupe. I hate the way it smells. I don't allow it in our refrigerator. Ask Patty. It doesn't go in our fridge because, you know, when you open it up and you get that smell, And you might think it's good. I think it's nauseous. Don't eat it. Don't like it. Okay, let me stop right here. I'm going to say something. Some of you have already thought, oh, but the cantaloupes I grow are sweeter than anything. If I could just get him one of my cantaloupes, don't bother. (laughs) Don't bother. Not going to eat it. I don't like it. That's a personal truth. I have mine. You have yours. You may love it. But here's, here's the thing. When it comes to personal truth, generally speaking... I don't believe that my truth is greater than your truth when it comes to cantaloupe or that I should impose my truth upon you. I don't believe you're wrong for liking it. Although, (laughs) so when you come to one of our fellowships and you're asked to bring a dish, it's okay now that you know what you know that you bring a fruit tray and you put cantaloupe on that fruit tray. Just know I won't eat any of it. Okay? But I'm not mad about that. I kind of allow that to happen. The problem that we're having in our culture today where personal truth is concerned is that we have a generation of people now who have been told that not only are your personal truths yours and they're true for you, but everyone else has to either agree with them or accept them or there is a problem there. Okay? So I could share with you this morning, and I'm going to be absurd for just a moment because we live in an absurd culture as far as I'm concerned. I could tell you this morning that one of my personal truths is that inside I am a cat. You laugh, but I could certainly tell you that. But I could take that a step further and I could say, since I believe that I'm a cat, I expect you to treat me like one. So I'm going to be looking for a litter box (laughs) somewhere on this campus. Because that's my personal truth, and I have every right to believe it. And therefore, you are required or expected to support it. That's personal truth. Now, one of the problems that we have in our culture today is that this concept that your truth is legitimate for you and should be supported by everybody else, has gotten so bizarre and out of hand, we just can't keep up with all the personal truths out there. Have you noticed that? 
And about the only way you can get through a day or a week or a month without offending someone's personal truth is just don't say anything. Because as soon as you say something, someone's going to say, wait a minute, I don't believe that. That's not a part of my truth. But we don't just have personal truth, do we? I kept looking, and I also found a definition for this thing we refer to as cultural truth. Now, cultural truth is different because cultural truth, that means that a bunch of us now have agreed. It's a consensus of the culture as to what is true. A theory, I love that word theory there, because just the word theory negates the word truth. It's the first word of the definition. A cultural truth is a theory. It might be, maybe, could be, should be. Is a theory, especially in ethics or aesthetics, that conceptions of truth and moral values, now we're going to introduce something different, of truth and moral values are not absolute, but are relative to the persons or groups holding them. Okay, so this is telling us that there are no absolutes, that cultural truth is simply a consensus of everybody's opinion or enough people's opinion. So if enough people hold this opinion, it can become culturally true. Now, we all know that it is the media that has a big influence on people's opinions. So I would argue that particularly in our culture today, in this age of information and technology, that the media is kind of managing this thing we refer to as cultural truth. They tell us what to believe. And, and a lot of us believe it. If enough people are doing it, it must be true. My mom, who's here again this morning, she used to say, when I'd want to do something, I'd say, everybody's doing it. And she would say, well, if everybody's jumped off a cliff, would you jump off the cliff? You ever said that, mom? You know, my answer then was no. My answer today was, of course I would. If everybody's doing it, there must be some legitimacy to it, right? That's the way the culture thinks. If you get enough people thinking it, enough people doing it, it must be True. I saw a, here's a case in point, I saw a documentary recently about the whole um, space uh, battle uh, back in the 60s when NASA was trying to get people on the moon and people out in space and all those kind of things. It was a, documentary, a really good documentary. And it kept showing this, this command room that was at NASA. It's a huge room, lots of chairs, lots of screens, lots of professionals in there working. One of the things that took me back as I was watching this shot out of the 60s was how many people in that room were smoking cigarettes. Now, I'm, I, we're living in a different culture, and, and I'm not, if you smoke, I'm not on you here at all. I'm just making a, I'm making a point here. I just want to say it was a commonplace kind of thing, way commonplace, and the room was full of smoke, and, and it's because if you look back at the history of this culture, cigarette smoking was culturally accepted and it was generally believed to be true that it didn't hurt you because enough people did it now let's fast forward to 2024 patty and i turned the tv on the other night and we went to this uh movie and it came up with the rating pg and then you know it tells you why it's rated that it said smoking <laughs> i said i don't know if we should watch this <laughs> Right? Do you, see, do you see what I'm saying? The culture has decided what's true and what's not. Now it is generally a truth in the culture that cigarette smoking is harmful. And I know there are, there are other things that go into that. But the idea is if you get enough people believing it, it must be true. Okay? But like in, like in the illustration I just gave, cultural truth tends to change from generation to generation. And God knew that about his broken world. God knew that the prince of this power, that the prince of the power of this air was Satan, at least for a period of time, and Satan is the father of lies, and he is going to lie to you, and he's going to lie to your culture about what is right and what is true, what is moral, what is immoral, what is good, what is bad. And it was going to be so confusing at times and so frustrating at times that we were not going to be able to keep up with it. We were not going to be able to discern good from evil, right from wrong. And so God gave us his truth that cuts through all the milieu like a knife that is a light for the darkness 
of deception and confusion that is in this world. He says, if you follow me, you've got to stay in touch with the word of God. It is truth without any mixture of air. You see, we can go on and we can look at what our Baptist faith and message says. I want to put this up about biblical truth. It says the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God's for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. We affirm the truth that is in God's word. And so several years back when we were thinking about values and how do we express the values of our church, we didn't just say we value truth because we know that can be a lot of things to a lot of people. But we specifically and expressly said we value biblical truth. Unashamedly, we believe in the word of God. And my challenge to this church moving forward from this point and forevermore, be known as a church that holds firm to biblical truth, unashamedly, without apology. Let's keep the Bible in the service, in the church. Let's keep it in our lives. Let's keep it where it belongs. Why is that a case? I want you to turn over to 2 Timothy, now chapter 3. Throughout 1st and 2nd Timothy, God calls Timothy back to the truth and back to the word. But, but here's why, and here's how he sums it up in 2nd Timothy chapter 3. And look at verse 14 and following. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been, in, been, you have been equate, acquainted with the sacred writings. There they are. Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete Equipped for every good work. Boom. There he goes. He gives several reasons why biblical truth must be a central value of the church and a central value of the Christian life. Number one, he points out that it is necessary for the fulfillment of God's mission given to his church. It is absolutely necessary. Watch. He says... That which you have firmly believed. I thank God this morning for having something firm that I can believe in. Firm that I can believe in. The word of God cuts through all of the confusion and all of the frustration. I may or may not agree with it. I'm going to tell you that right now. I, read th- I may or may not understand it all. And there are times when I've said, honestly, if I'd have written it, it probably sounded something different. But I believe it's true. When, when I went to seminary in, back in the 80s, the Southern Baptist Convention was having its biblical inerrancy wars. And, and, and scholars were debating as to its, its inerrancy and whether all of it was accurate or just some of it was accurate. And, and there was a saying that came out and was being propagated throughout the convention from the conservative side that said something like this. The Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And I remember my dad coming up and saying, no, 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 that's not what I want to say. I want to say the Bible says it and that settles it whether I believe it or not. It's biblical truth. It is, and it's necessary. We don't have anything else to teach. We don't have anywhere else to go. So I have to tell you, I cringe when people will say to me, Pastor, I went to several churches before I came to Old Fort and you're the first person I've heard preach from the Bible. And my question is, what else do they say? What else is there? It is necessary. It is sufficient. Biblical truth is sufficient for the fulfillment of God's mission given to the church. He talks about their wisdom. Look look down in verse 15 of chapter 3. He says, it gives you wisdom. 
And how from childhood you have been acquainted with these sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. All right, let's talk about this for a second. If I were to ask you what is the purpose of the church, we could have that debate over and over and over again, and we've got all these things that have come in. But when you look at Scripture, the church is the body of Jesus Christ, and Jesus came to save sinners. What we do here on this earth is temporary. What we do for people that, that uh, having to do with salvation is eternal. What we do that supports us is temporary. What we do that supports the kingdom is eternal. This church exists to save sinners. And the gospel of Jesus Christ that is recorded in his word is sufficient for that. It is sufficient for that. And the Holy Spirit of God is the acting agent when the Scripture is being taught. And here's what I want to to challenge you with. If you've got someone who is in your life who is lost, who is broken, don't try to reason or rationalize with them because you won't be able to do that. Give them, thus saith the Lord God. Let them read it. Let them understand it. And let the Holy Spirit of God have an opportunity to take that word and make it alive in their hearts and in their minds. Share it with them because it is sufficient. It's what we need to know. It's what we need to know. Stay true to the word. It is sufficient. He goes on and he points out in verse 16 that biblical truth is authoritative for the fulfillment of God's mission. It's authoritative. All scripture is breathed out by God. Now look, look at me this way for a second. I got to tell you, this is, this is where I sometimes get a little nauseous when I'm reading about what other scholars might be saying about the word of God. I had a seminary professor who stood before the class and raised up his Bible and said, if you think you can preach this whole word as truth, you're crazy. And I thank God for allowing me to be crazy these last 30 years. It is authoritative in that it's breathed out by God. Now listen, if you say to someone, well, I love God, but I'm just not sure about the Bible. Let me ask you, what God do you love? Are we going to say, uh, first of all, let's, let's admit and let's agree that as a document, okay, let's yes or no, as a document, the Holy Bible is the central document for Christianity. Would you agree with that? Whether you agree with it or not. I mean, this is Christians all around the world use the Bible and just the Bible as their, as their guide. This is what we have. Did you, do you think God knew that? Do you think that surprised him? What are you people doing with that book? I didn't have anything to do with it. No, God God ordained this. Now, here's the other question. Do you believe God, knowing that it was going to be our central document, would allow it to be full of errors? Like he didn't have any control over it. Well, you know, and then people tell me, well, that that was written by man. Oh, so God said, man, I really wish I could get truth over these people, but I, I can't, I don't have any authority. I don't have any power over these people and what they're doing. God has breathed his breath into this. He's made it alive. And I love that concept of God breathed. We see that in the Old Testament. We see it in the book of Genesis when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. It is the ruach. It is the breath of God, the life of God. It's his word. It is God breathed. It is authoritative. You see, here, here's where, where we need to understand how to know and live the Word of God. You remember that thing I talked about, cultural truth? If everyone on the planet believes something other than this Word, as Christians, we need to stay with this Word. Because God is a majority. This, our faith, our belief is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. God is in control and he's told us what we are to do and how, what we are to believe and how we are to live. And we don't get a vote on that. 
We can either be submissive to it or rebellious of it. That's our choice, and we need to know that. It is the authoritative word of God. It is truth without any mixture of errors. But then he goes on and says it's instructive. Look at what he says. Breathed by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. That's what we do. Doctrine, discipline, discipling, encouraging, supporting. It teaches us how to pray. It teaches us how to encourage one another. It teaches us how to counsel those who are going through difficult times. It gives us hope in the darkness. It's God's truth. And it is instructive. We need to learn it. We need to learn it. There is no place for biblical illiteracy in our churches today. We have access to the Word of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Let me take it into your Word. You who are commuters, I just want to challenge you. Find a good uh, 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 verbal reading of Scripture that you could put on your radio your, or your podcast. And while you're commuting back and forth, get off those, those murder mysteries and get on the Word of God. And just let it take root in your heart and in your soul. Plan time daily to get into the Word, to learn the Word. Get in small groups that you can study the Word together. It is instructive, and we need to know how to live out the Christian faith. And the last thing he tells us, he's, or he says to Timothy, and to, through Timothy to us, he says the, the biblical truth is effective. It'll work. I love the way he ends this. That the man of God may be complete. This is what we need. It is complete, equipped for every good work. See, you, there's a lot of good books out there written by good people about biblical things. I'm going to be real careful here. But there's also a lot of not so good ones. Remind me a lot of cantaloupe. Real sweet, but I can't stomach it. You say, Pastor, how do we know the difference? You start here. Is what they're teaching and what they're saying, is it consistent with what you're finding in the Word of God? What's being taught in your Sunday school class? What's being taught from the pulpit in this church and other places where you have been exposed to the Word of God? Does it line up? Because the Word of God is effective, and it will equip for every good work. So, I start with this. As we continue the good fight, let's continue with the Word of God. As I challenge you, in this season when I am going to be Moving out and someone else is going to be moving in. Make sure, make sure that the one of the first questions, if not the first question you ask to any candidate coming in to do anything is, what do you think about this book? And where are you going to go with it? That's my challenge. But I challenge you individually. Don't just wait to be fed on Sunday morning. Get into your word. Get into the truth. There is so much false doctrine out there. It is rampant and thick. We have the truth. Thank you for visiting this message from Old Fort Baptist Church. Here at Old Fort, we value biblical truth, missional living, and vital connections. To learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit us online at oldfortbaptist.org. To help support the ongoing ministry of the church, you can give at oldfortbaptist.org slash give. Thank you, and God bless.